Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to UMass Dartmouth and to our memorial service today. It is very fitting to have this service here because Nasir uh, spent so much of his life here, and he loved the university so very much. So it's very, very nice that um, our chancellor was able to make all of this uh, come true for the family. So it's very, very fitting that we're all here to honor him today. And thank you all for coming to help commemorate and celebrate the wonderful life of Mr. Aruri, our dear friend, colleague, father, husband, grandfather, professor at this university for over 30 years, a scholar activist, an author, and the many other roles that we know him by. We share sorrow and loss at his passing, but rejoice that we had our time together. My name is Maria Furman Duffy, and I am a Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of the UMass System, and I would like to pass on our condolences to the family on behalf of the Board. More importantly, I have been a close friend of Nasir and his family for over 40 years, and that's why I'm here. He was my professor and head of the Political Science Department. I'd like to know how many other students are here, if you could stand up, if there are any other students from way back when. Few. Oh, a whole bunch right there. Okay. Oh, and there. Okay. <laughs> okay. He was fantastic. Um, he became my mentor and a dear friend for life. Later on, I had the pleasure of meeting Joyce and his children. They were very young at the time. Karen, Ferris, Jamal, and Jay. They adopted me as extended family, and knowing how hospitality runs deep in the Aruri clan, you can see that I was the lucky one. I am truly honored that the family asked me to participate in this event and I hope I can live up to the task. I know many of you have traveled far and wide to be here today and we really appreciate it. We're glad to be able to honor him and share his memories with friends, colleagues, and family. Each person listening in the program will speak briefly about this year. They, they, we have all been touched in various ways by his life, his energy, and his passion. They will share their experiences about how he touched them, as well as the love and laughter that made up the core of his life. By way of a brief introduction, I would like to mention our speakers. Jamal Murray, his dear son, his dear Joyce's son. Uh, Dr. Hanny Ferris, who is a managing director at Intergulf Investment Corporation and also teaches uh, at the Institute of Asian Research at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, who's a very dear friend, as well as all the other speakers you will hear from, and as well as all of you in the audience, because if you were, were not a dear friend, you would not be here. Um, we could, could have had everyone speak, but this would take a two-day seminar to do that. We can't do that, unfortunately. So. Um, Dr. Elaine Agopian, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Simmons College. Dr. Um, Majid Kazimi, TEPCO Professor of Nuclear Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Dr. Nancy Murray, Education Director at ACLU of Massachusetts. Dr. John Carroll, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at UMass Dartmouth. Dr. Abdeen Jabara, Civil Rights Attorney from New York. Dr. Cheryl Rubenberg, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Florida International University, and our last speaker, Joyce, his dearest wife. Following the speakers, we will have a brief slideshow video that the family has put together as a tribute to Nasir's life. We then invite you all to stay and join us for refreshments and some food so that we can enjoy this time of sharing together and our remembrances of our very dear friend. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Davina Grossman, the Chancellor of UMass Dartmouth, who will say a few words. She's been so very supportive in the planning of this service, as well as John Hoey, who has been terrific in making this happen. So I would like to, t to thank her and her team very much on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Trustee Furman. Good morning to all of you. I must add, uh, Maria, that um, Nasir must have been very proud of you, a uh, former student who graduated from UMass Dartmouth, rose to become the managing director at Standish Air and Wood in Boston, 
and is now the vice chair or the board of trustees of the entire University of Massachusetts system. That's the governing board for the entire system, including the five campuses. So thank you, Trustee Maria Furman. And I stand here as the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth, representing many of the faculty, those who served when uh, Professor Aruri was here, those who are faculty members at present. I have the Provost Muhammad Karim, who's here, standing there. Provost Karim, you can sit. There's a vacant chair there. Um, our Senior Vice Chancellor, Jerry Cavanaugh. We have the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Jen Riley, here. And uh, other members of my cabinet, would you please stand up so they know that you're in the house. Thank you. Um, I would like to express uh, condolences to the family of Professor Nasir Aruri. And although I have not had the pleasure of meeting all of you yet, I have met a few times with Joyce and Karen. Uh, and this morning, I met Faris and Jamal and Jay. And I met a number of Professor Aruri's grandchildren. There is such a feeling of warmth. And I could already tell, just from walking into the room, there is a sense of family, a sense of community, many, many fond memories of Professor Aruri. The soul of any great university is the faculty. And we gather this morning to honor one of the greatest who ever served here at UMass Dartmouth, Chancellor Professor Nasir H. Aruri, an internationally renowned expert on the Middle East, an author or editor of nine books, including one that was just published last year, titled A Bitter Legacy, the United States in the Middle East. Albert Einstein once said that peace cannot be kept by force, that it can only be achieved through understanding. It is an honor for me to stand here to celebrate the life of Chancellor Professor Aruri, who devoted 33 years of his life from 1965 to 1998 here at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth as a professor of political science, as a department chair, as a mentor to many students, as a colleague to many of you. He taught in these classrooms. He walked in these hallways. He explored and exchanged ideas with students and faculty members here. He attended events here. He held office hours here. He was part of the fabric and the texture of the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And through his own way, he worked to achieve peace through understanding. I did not have the pleasure of knowing Professor Aruri, but over the past few months, I have been blessed to meet his wonderful, loving, and strong wife, Joyce. And I understand that when he passed away, it was two days short of your 54th wedding anniversary. And his loving daughter, Karen, who followed in her father's footsteps and also teaches here, uh, she teaches French and Spanish. The stories that they have recounted about Nasir are stories of a man who loved teaching, who loved scholarship, who loved UMass Dartmouth, who loved his students, who loved his family, loved his wife dearly, loved his sons and his daughter, loved Faris and Jamal and Karen and Jay, and loved his 13 grandchildren, and loved the pursuit of peace and human dignity around the world. Now consider the reflection of retired Professor Mel Yokin, who's actually here in the crowd. He sent a note and described Professor Aruri. He said he will be remembered for his clear-minded intelligence, his consummate dignity, his indefatigable spirit, and his love of the French language. He was a brilliant man, held true and steadfast to his convictions and beliefs, yet very approachable at all levels. 
to his colleagues, and to his students. The qualities that made Nasir a great scholar, his lack of guile, his warmth and kindness, made him also a very good friend and colleague. We who were privileged to enjoy his friendship will miss him terribly. Thank you, Professor Yokin, for those recollections. If you could just raise your hand so they know you're here. He's back there. The turnout today is testament to the respect, the admiration, and love with which Professor Nasir Aruri is held, not only in the community on this campus, but in the community around the world. One need not agree with Nasir's viewpoints in order to respect and admire him. In fact, that is when you know, when you're faced with greatness and authenticity, when you can disagree and still admire, admire the passion, the willingness to express sometimes a controversial or minority view, to admire the dedication to make an intellectual rather than an ideological argument. We certainly need a lot more of that ethos and in that spirit in our world today. This academic year is fast coming to a close. Uh, commencement begins on May 15th. And it has been a celebration of the golden anniversary of the 1964 groundbreaking of the campus of the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. It was a year after the 1964 groundbreaking that a young man showed up on campus. He had earned his BA in history from the American International College and his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And that was Professor Nasir Aruri, who came to teach political science. That was a time when the mission of this campus was being challenged. There were those in Boston who believed that this campus should be limited to technical fields, but our students, our faculty, and the surrounding community would have none of that. They wanted and deserved more, and they wanted the campus to expand to liberal arts programs. And so they protested. They marched in a torch relay from Dartmouth to Boston to defend the idea that real higher education required more than an examination of the physical world, but an examination of ourselves and of our society. Thank goodness the protesters won, because otherwise Nasir Aruri would not have been able to set down roots here and become part of this community and earn a global reputation as an expert on the Middle East and have an impact on the lives of countless of students and faculty colleagues along the way. <clears throat> In a few weeks, we will send forth hundreds of newly minted UMass Dartmouth graduates. None of them in this class had the good fortune to be taught or mentored by Professor Aruri, as Trustee Maria Furman had been, but their education has undoubtedly been influenced by him, by his development of a world-class political science department, by his scholarship, and by his scholarly example that he has set for his colleagues and other students, not only in this class, but generations more of students to come. Sir Isaac Newton said, if I had seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Nasir Aruri was one of our giants. Thank you. In case I need it. So I'll leave it here for any future speakers. Um, as the first speaker today, is this on? as the first speaker today, I would like to begin by telling you about the man I knew on a personal level, not about his work, his many career accomplishments, the books he wrote, the seminars he gave, the Palestinian cause that was always on his mind. No, not about that, 
Other people will cover that. But only about the things I will never forget that we shared as friends, the ordinary things of life that are so dear. It was, a, it was my good fortune and privilege to meet the Arori family back in the late 70s when I was a student, as I mentioned. He was my professor. He was so smart, so distinguished. His accent gave him an air of sophistication and his classiness was hard to match. A bit intimidating for a girl like me, an immigrant from the Azores, struggling to find my place in a new land. Maybe that's why I liked him so much. We were both immigrants. He offered me his counsel, his time, and experience. Sometime after graduation, I met Joyce, the love of his life, and we developed a unique relationship that has evolved into my becoming a lifelong family friend. They became my advisors, my mentors, my cooking teachers, my travel companions, my friends, and so much more. But let me tell you a little about that. We all have many memories to share about Nasir, much like you, and um, I'd like to share some of these. I remember fondly that Nasir liked to cook and also had quite a garden that was the source of many vegetable dishes that he made. He was a man ahead of his time. I would call him an almost vegan. Loved his vegetables and he grew them proudly and there was always an abundance of, of uh, produce in the house. I visited at least monthly, and we, he would whip up so many creative dishes that only he could season so well. Not forgetting to give Joyce credit, as she was a wonderful cook in her own right, and she did most of the cooking, actually. <laughs> she did a lot of it. But when Nasir did it, it was unique. My favorite dish was this Adas soup. A peasant pea soup, and many of you might be familiar with this soup, that I watched him make often, and I would say, don't start cooking until I get there. I want to know how you do it. There was this thing about the seasoning that was his magic sauce, and it was very hard to figure out because every time he did it, he did it a little differently, but it all tasted so good, and he never measured. You know, it was a little of this and a little of that. So I would, um, uh, then he would make great salads. We'd have hummus, tabui, kibbe, kanafi, hashwi, you name it, he made it. And I tried very hard to try to go home and replicate it. And I would follow them around with notepad in hand in the kitchen, taking notes and, and trying to get it all down so I could uh, do this at home. Of course, it never came out quite right, unfortunately. I often said that I must have some Arabic blood um, as I love all the food they made. And since the Moors occupied Portugal for over 700 years, no doubt that I do. Often, after our many dinners with us or other friends, the conversation turned to politics, places we wanted to go, and many other topics. We all loved to travel, and I was the one in the group who generally planned trips for us to take, having the pleasure to get Nasir and Joyce to try things that they would never do, wouldn't even dream of doing. I will never forget the times we went on ski trips for the weekend. You did not know Nasir skied. Did any of you know Nasir skied? Okay. Well, he did not actually. <laughs> not actually. This is how they went. We would drive up with some other couples, load up the car with food. We'd rent a place in New Hampshire or Vermont, and he would spend the weekend cooking, making artists and other things, playing cards, lots of cards, re laughing, and reading. Often never leaving the place for three days. So he'd come up, he'd stay the whole time, Others would ski, but Nasir and Joyce were in charge of food and fun, and we just loved those weekends. I was responsible for getting Joyce and Nasir to go camping for the first time. Ah, the year was 1977, and I remember it like yesterday. We took our little boat and went up to a campsite at Winnipesaukee Lake. Us, the four kids, the dog, sounds like a happy picture, <laughs> these guys remember, except that it rained all weekend. Their tent leaked, Elvis died, I went, went into mourning, I cried. They tried to make me feel better. This was August 1977. They tried to make me feel better. I remember we played cards inside the wet tent. I think Ferris was holding the flashlight and we're trying to play poker, all crammed up into this little tent by flashlight. We cooked out of soup on the fire. Joyce couldn't sleep on the hard ground, and Nasir had to go to the chiropractor when he got home. <laughs> but we all said it was the best time, and we would do it again, except Joyce said she'd have to stay at the motel, so we, we didn't actually do it again. I also influenced them into taking sailing lessons on Boston Harbor, and it turned out to, unfortunately, be a very windy week, 
and they had an Israeli instructor who was fabulous, but they spent a lot of time talking about you know what. <laughs> so I don't know if they learned any sailing that week. Nasir got into boating, and as you all know, he loved to fish and go out on his boat. I had a small motorboat at the time that he bought from me, and then after that, his boats kept getting bigger and bigger, because the kids also got bigger and bigger. We went on a trip one year to Montes Vineyard, one fourth of July, on that small boat, and the engine died. I still recollect Karen and I waving white towels, and we sent out flares, but of course on the fourth of July, a flare means nothing. <laughs> and the white towels weren't big enough, but we were trying to get somebody's attention. But we did get rescued, and after that he got a better boat. We traveled to Italy and around Tuscany and saw the Palio in Siena, and we spent a lot of time in Florida together, again cooking and playing cards and laughing and traveling, and we had places near each other. Our last trip was about five years ago when I had the pleasure of going to the Azores with them, a place we talked about for 40 years, so it was very gratifying that he finally got to see it. We had many special times that I will always remember. Our lives were intertwined for 40 years. I was so blessed to have his friendship and share good times as a family. His impact on my life is hard to describe. He is irreplaceable. A kind and generous man of integrity, courage, love of others, and love of service. His values, his intellect, his passion for justice, all without peer. He was above all a family man. He raised four outstanding children, 13 lucky grandchildren, and Joyce's constant companion and his best caretaker in good times and bad is a woman of courage and strength, my role model as well. I can't imagine my life without these two key people in it. There's an empty spot in my heart today, and there will, as there will be no new memories to make, our time together was short. We will miss you, Nasir, but know that you are loved. I would like to have Jamal come up. I actually uh, remember that camping trip. Is it? Uh, I, I remember that camping trip uh, really well, and uh, I think we were probably 10 or 11 years old at the time. And where it, it was kind of strange to us that you actually could convince my mother to go camping because <laughs> it's really not her thing. Um, and we're in, the, we're in the tent, me and my brothers and sisters, and, and the rain's coming down, and my mother seems really, really aggravated, and Maria is bawling. And I assume that you were upset because you had coerced my mother into going camping, and it was a disaster. <laughs> so I said to my mother, I said, why is Maria crying? And she says, I don't know, Elvis died. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the, the king wasn't really uh, a big deal in our house growing up. <laughs> whole thing got lost on us, but... At any rate, thanks, Maria. Thanks, Dr. Grossman. Thanks, all the wonderful staff that, you know, is here and did so much work to, to, to really make this such a, a memorable day. Memorable day. It's, um, it's nice to be here. It's comforting to be here um, because everything that was important to my father, our father, is actually in this room. Uh, Joyce, our treasured mother, his companion for over half a century, uh, his children and their spouses, 13 grandchildren, in case you're wondering what order they're in. Uh, Jay has provided buttons for him, which is really nice, and will give you the order as long, uh, along with the picture of, of Cito. And um, he has nieces and nephews here, Reem and Hassan. Um, in-laws, uh, friends, students, colleagues, um, and, 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 and we're in the physical structure of the university that he taught at for 33 years and, and, and loved very much. Um, at the uh, life's, life's journey for my father um, was anything but predictable. He had grown up in, in, in Jerusalem, Palestine. Um, he had graduated from high school. He was doing some teaching there, and he wasn't really sure what his next step was going to be. Um, but it was decided that he would go to the United States to pursue uh, an education. And uh, his father, uh, at the time, he was, at this, this point, my father was uh, 20 years old, and his father um, gave him a plane ticket, uh, one tuition, one semester's tuition and money, and uh, two pieces of advice. And those were study something practical uh, 
and stay away from women. <laughs> and I can say uh, he succeeded on neither front. <laughs> the plan was to uh, attend uh, AIC, American International College in Springfield, um, where his older brother Saeed, the uh, father of, of my cousin Hassan and my cousin Rima, um, had already been an undergraduate there. And uh, he knew little about America and even really less about the college that he was going to be attending. Um, my uncle Saeed had uh, picked up um, my father at uh, Logan Airport. It was a rainy day in December 1954. And he drove him to his first home in America. And uh, it had the seemingly benign address of 50 Western Avenue in Springfield, which also happened to be the Zeta Chi Fraternity House. For people who know my father, that's not exactly the best fit <laughs> for the young, idealistic, studious Nasir. Um, like many immigrants, uh, he really struggled, uh, especially in his early life, with the concept of identity. As a young boy in Palestine, his family had residences both in uh, Jerusalem and the uh, village that his um, family would spend summers in, uh, in Braham, which is um, not too far away. And um, there were terms that were used uh, in Palestine, Arabic terms, throughout the Arab world for um, city kids versus village kids. And they were important uh, at that time in terms of uh, understanding distinctions. And um, when he was in Jerusalem, the city kids would call him a falah, which was kind of the boy from the village or the country. And when he would go back to the village after uh, the school year was done in Braham, they would call him Medini, which is the city kid. And both groups of kids would say either Medini or Falah pejoratively. In other words, you're not, you're not one of us. So he was caught between this, you know, this city distinction versus village distinction. And then he ends up at Zeta Chi Fraternity House where I'm guessing the falah medini dichotomy of century, 20th century Palestine wasn't exactly, a hot, wasn't exactly a hot topic. And then he was referred to simply as Saeed's brother. He had a, he, he had a difficult time at AIC, he really did. Um, despite his name, it had very few international students. Uh, it didn't have a single political science course, which is what he wanted to study. Um, he spent most of his time studying, and uh, he was working second shift at a, at a local textile uh, factory in order to pay for his tuition and his living expenses. And it really wasn't until he met and later fell in love with a young woman of Lebanese ancestry named Joyce Thomas that things began to change for the better for my dad. And although he was a Muslim from Palestine, and she a Maronite from Catholic from Springfield, the love that they had for each other transcended religious affiliations. And while at this time um, that type of union uh, was not popular, my parents really were never into what was popular. They were into what was right. And their decision to fall in love, marry, and start a family could not have been more right. The young couple soon forged a joint identity, an inseparable bond based upon shared values, mutual respect, and an uncanny admiration for the other. Following their, mar following their marriage, my father had no job, little money, and he knew that he would need to get a PhD in order to secure employment. The young couple drove from Springfield down to Baton Rouge in an old beat up car to LSU, and then they went on to Texas Tech with their firstborn in tow, Farris, in the back seat, and my father pursued graduate courses at Texas Tech. Living in the Deep South in the mid-1960s, their views on equality were unpopular, their bank account near empty, and their future very much up in the air. It wasn't until a full grant for PhD program opened up at UMass Amherst and later a full-time faculty position had opened up at this university that they were able to find a bit of stability. My father would eventually emerge as a specialist in the Middle East in general and Palestine in particular and he began to write and speak widely in this area. And although there was, although there were many obstacles facing the Palestinian people, 
there was always a pervasive theme that he would refer to in his speaking engagements and in his writing. And that's what he called transforming constraints into opportunities. It also just so happened to be a microcosm of his early life in America. Although my father was both a scholar and an activist, activism always took precedent. He spent the majority of his life working and fighting so that the Palestinian people could attain a normal existence. And in a field where there have been countless sellouts, inflated egos, and opportunities for personal gain, my father always remained focused on advancing the cause of his people. Not only his people, but all dispossessed peoples around the world. He was as principled as they come, never dogmatic, and not a speech maker. His approach was always rational and grounded, never engaging in rhetoric or bravado. He never allowed a feeling of self-importance to get in the way of working with others to advance the cause. And whether that meant collaborating with renowned intellectuals or meant mentoring a young student who had expressed an interest in Palestine, my father's commitment remained the same. He wasn't without his shortcomings, however. His um, strong work ethic also resulted in a failure to sometimes appreciate his limitations. As uh, children, my brother and Jay, growing up, had to endure multiple odd-looking haircuts <laughs> due to my father's conviction that he was as capable a barber as he was a professor. <laughs> Even our large poodle Frankie was not exempt from my father's <laughs> fascination with his clippers. I recall spending a hot summer afternoon where my father pulled out his clippers. We had just adopted Frankie a couple of days ago. He didn't know us very well and my father thought it would be a good idea to give Frankie a haircut. Jay and I were glad we went first. And I remember being with my siblings and my mother and we were trying to hold this dog steady and there was a tug of war going on and my father's out there with his clippers and he's clipping this very large poodle and the large curly thick black hair. It seemed like it went on for hours and after the last curl had been trimmed my father was marveling at the fruits of his labor and Frankie proceeded to run up the street as fast as any dog could run. <laughs> we never saw Frankie again. <laughs> And that's a true story. <laughs> Growing up in our house, um, the traditional sexist roles of the time that were assigned to husband and wife were actually reversed in our house. People probably know, some of you might not, but most people do, that my father couldn't distinguish a touchdown from a home run let alone understand the complexities of American sports. So it was my mother who would take us to all of our football, basketball, and baseball games, and my father remained home cooking dinner. Once in a while, my father would appear at one of our sporting events, not really understanding what was going on, and depending on what the Reagan White House did or said that day, it was 50-50 whether he would rise for the national anthem. <laughs> like many of his fellow expatriates, my father was never really completely at ease in America or in the Arab world. And this would often lead to, let's just say, some inconsistencies on occasion. He would often reminisce about the wonderful simplicity of life in the Arab world that included large gatherings of family and friends in modest homes until one of those gatherings actually took place. Then he would horrifically recount the chain-smoking guests arriving hours late, kids running wild with no parental supervision, and all the excess food that was central to the culture he had just earlier embraced. As my brothers and sisters are well aware, my father's lectures in the house were no less comprehensive than those in the classroom. We know never to say that we were starving because there were children that actually were, and not to complain about we didn't, what we didn't have because 
most of the world had far less. And while as a kid, while as a kid the lectures would seem old and tiresome, today we're all grateful that our parents stressed idealism over assimilation, compassion over self-interest, and resistance over silence. And Dad, those values that you and Mom instilled in us didn't fall on deaf ears. When your illness progressed and life had become so difficult for you, your family never stopped trying to make all those difficult days a bit more bearable. Karen, your daughter, who took her first steps the day that you got your PhD, she held you up, she held Ma up, her courage and strength helped us all up. She'd fight back the tears while cooking your favorite fabric meals to bring to you. Her sorrow would turn to joy, as did yours, when your face would light up as she entered your room. She made sure your sisters were okay after caring for you because she promised you that she would. Faris, visiting you virtually every day after long hours at work, completely exhausted and continually astonishing your nurses and physical therapists as we'd get you out of bed and walk you through the halls of the rehab facility, both of you proud of each and every step you took. At every juncture, he made sure the care you were getting was the best care possible, and no one was as, be no one was as invested in the hope that you would overcome your illness as him. Jay, giving Ma some much needed rest by sleeping with you in the hospital after your stroke, driving his family up and back from Cincinnati to be with you every chance he had. Despite his towering physical presence that he got from you, he is the most sensitive of all your children. And it hurt him so much to see you unhappy. While dealing with the commitments of a job and family, he worked endless hours behind the computer and on the telephone to make today a memorable one. Ma, she loved you more than any wife could love a husband. You hated when she left the room, whether you were young and vibrant or old and frail. Your lifelong companion, your confidant, your anchor. The woman who pushed you toward all of your life's achievements. You looked up to her more than any dignitary, intellectual giant, or world leader you ever crossed paths with. As you got weaker, she was constantly by your side, telling you not to worry, everything was going to be okay, while masking the heartache of knowing that it wasn't. And while you never lived to see justice for Palestine and a dignified life for your people, surely the constraints they continue to face will one day be transformed into opportunities. And while this day will have come without you bearing witness, it will mark the harvest of the seedlings that you and countless others planted during the best days of your life. Parkinson's disease may have taken your life, but there is no force in this world strong enough that can erase all the good you left behind. We love you. We admire you. We miss you so very much. Your physical presence is no longer here, but everything you've helped create, you've championed, and worked tirelessly throughout your life remains. Friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hani Ferris, and I'll be addressing the topic of the legacy of Nasir Aruri. We met in 1973 and became the closest of friends. 
Our friendship lasted about half of his lifetime, and so far counts for more than half of mine. It was a relationship akin to one between intimate brothers. This long journey started when we taught at the same institution and in the same department. Over the years, we joined a number of organizations in which we alternated with one serving in a leadership position while the other provided backup support. We collaborated in developing and implementing programs and went on to found other organizations. Meanwhile, I published in some of his edited books and he published in mine. We acted as sounding boards to each other and exchanged manuscripts and ideas to solicit comments and suggestions. I valued and appreciated his insights and academic judgments. We spent considerable time planning and organizing conferences, conventions, and panels, some of which became noted events. Understandably, Nasir's death hurt me deeply, and I find my solace in his legacy that lives on and the knowledge that I am very privileged to have known him. Nasir left a legacy which is appreciated by a significant number of people and explains the love and admiration he received. It accounts for the sentiments of anguish and sorrow that were expressed by individuals, groups, movements, organizations, and institutions in the US and overseas. I personally tracked this outpouring of sorrow and cannot recall more than a few Arab and Arab American leaders whose departure triggered such a wave of bereavement. No wonder Nadia Hijab, executive director of the Palestinian Policy Network, wrote in her obituary of Nasir to quote, there are those whose life and work touch the lives of tens of thousands for decades. Nasir Aruri was one such man. My memories, recollections, and knowledge of the life and works of Nasir lead me to conclude that his legacy is twofold. The first and foremost was his abiding love, commitment, dedication, and attachment to his Palestinian Arab identity and to the national cause of the people of Palestine, which gave meaning to his life. At all stages of his life and in the majority of his publications, Nasir struggled for the realization of a vision which he defined as the building of a future Palestinian society that is humane, free, democratic, socially just, and based on the rule of law. Guided by an unshakable belief in the justice of his cause and its ultimate victory, he never compromised his principles or allowed himself to be guided by vengeance or hate or considerations of ethnicity, religion, and race. Though he was called the voice of Palestine in the United States, he was also known as an ardent humanist who defended the rights of everyone. The director of Amnesty International wrote in his commemoration, Nasir embodied what it means to defend the rights of human beings, wherever truth and dignity are being deprived. His connection to amnesty will live on. According to Nasir, Palestinian society has been subjected since 48 to an Israeli policy of politicide aimed at destroying its political existence and imposed a process of dispossession, deinstitutionalization, and proletarization of an entire people. 
The very nature of Israeli society, he believed, precludes equality between Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs and persists because of the gross imbalance of power and rights among the two sides. The Israeli state is determined to replace the entire Palestinian community in the occupied territories. It subjugates them to military occupation, deprives them of their right to self-determination, and prevents them from realizing their national dream of establishing their sovereign state on part of their own historic territory. Given the realities of Israeli occupation, pursuit of statehood is not a realistic option or objective for the Palestinians. They should give up the illusion of the two, two states, Nasir wrote, for two people, and adopt instead a strategic long-term goal of building a binational country in all of Palestine. This future entity will be built on equal rights, equal citizenship, plurality, and coexistence. Nasir knew how to temper his idealism with a good measure of realism and ability at forecasting events. Afflicted by chaos, repression, and moral decay, the Arab world turned after Oslo into a subcontractor for the US and is incapable of coming to the aid of the Palestinians. As far back as 90, he forecast physical devastation of the Middle Eastern region, disintegration of Iraq, and chronic regional instability for at least a generation to come. Unlike some of his colleagues who pressured the PLO leadership to make the concessions demanded by the American administration at the time as a precondition to recognize them and who also sub celebrated the Oslo agreements. Nasir saw in these tragic moves an attempt to divest the Palestinian cause of its national characteristics. While others were predicting the onset of peace and the rise within a short period of a sovereign Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, Nasir correctly prophesied it will be a, pro a process leading to fragmented, subjugated, exploit exploited, miniature Palestinian cantons under Israeli-style apartheid. Though they face historic challenges, and their chances in the immediate and medium terms are extremely bleak. Nasir cautioned the Palestinians against despair. It is not the end of Palestinian history. And Palestine continues to exist in the collective consciousness of its own people. Palestine was definitely an essential part of his own consciousness. And he was determined to do something about it. He practiced what he believed, and Nasir was known to his colleagues and associates as the activist in the intellectual. For several years, he involved himself in the Palestinian National Council and the Central Council of the PLO. He also served on the boards of directors of Human Rights Watch, Middle East, Amnesty International, USA, the Independent Palestinian Commission, for the protection of citizens' rights, the Arab Organization for Human Rights, and many, many, many others. But his activism was most profound, was most pronounced in the founding of institutions, organizations, mass-based popular movements, fronts, coalitions, and other forms of associations that promote team building, and team effort. Charisma, dedication, leading by example, honesty, self-denial, modesty, humility, and a vast knowledge were among the personality attributes that made Nasir successful in his endeavors and encouraged people to follow him. Even today, I keep discovering a new organization new organizations within the US, Europe, and the Middle East, where Nasir was either one of the founders or occupied a position of authority within them. 
Herein lays the second aspect of Nasir's legacy. To write about Nasir's activism deserves a study by itself. In this occasion, I elect to touch on the one experience that occupied the best part of his life, namely his role in building and participating in the Association of Arab American University Graduates, AAUG. Over time, the AUG formed the largest and most effective community of Arab academics and professionals outside the Arab world. Nasir participated in the organization from the time it was founded in 1967 until and until its eclipse several decades later. Together with a group of like-minded academics and professionals known for their patriotism, nationalism, secularism, and belief in third world liberation, they created a political cultural movement for Arab Americans and other progressive Americans, became the recognized voice of their community and served as its intellectual leaders throughout the 60s, 70s, and 1980s. Nasir refers to these years as the most glorious chapter in Arab organizing, combined with scholarly production in North America. Nasir's commitment to the association was unwavering and total. The tasks were many, and the means were very modest. Whenever there was a mass mailing, Nasir, Joyce, their children, and the friends of their children were marshaled for long sessions of envelope stuffing and stamp licking. Though it did not withstand the test of time, Nasir never regretted the years he invested in AUG. After all, he and his colleagues had produced impressive scholarship, mobilized some of the top Arab and third world minds in the service of liberation causes, created bridges of understanding and mutual support with other American minorities, and most importantly, inculcated a new generation of young Arab Americans with worthwhile values and prepared them for a future activist role. In 1988, he and his friend, Elena Gopian, established the Trans-Arab Research Institute, Terry, which in turn, and with the assistance of Nancy Murray, convened the historic conference on the Palestinian right of return. Terry remains active today, and the conference triggered the rise of an international network of organizations defending the Palestinians' right of return. The death of Nasir brings a chapter in the history of Arab Americans to an end. A mutual friend sent Joyce and me a message of condolences that expressed my inner feelings in a manner I could not have explained or expressed better. He said, for me, Nasir was among the rare individuals who make you feel secure and truly optimistic by their mere presence on this planet. His commitment to objective truth whether as a researcher, an analyst, or as a basis for judgment, made him the best model of what a true scientist and a true Arab are like. He made his world better than what it was before he joined it. It is a life worth celebrating. Thank you. tell you that uh, I am the antique in this uh, audience. I think I'm older than everybody here. So if I'm a little bit slow, you'll just uh, bear with me. I have to tell you that I, I want to take a little credit for Nasir. He was a student of mine 
at uh, Smith College. He was at the University of Amherst and he took a seminar at Smith College. And he spoke very little, but when he spoke it was pearls. And I thought to myself, that guy deserves an A because he doesn't speak in blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, and so uh, that was my first meeting with Nasir. And then the 67 war brought us all together again. I'm going to make very brief remarks. Um, and I'm just going to say that, you know, we all knew Nasir was a man of impeccable integrity, so I don't need to go any further into that. I'd like to talk about other facets of Nasir's personality. And I'll just tell you a couple of stories about him. But first, let me say that Nasir was a feminist. He was a feminist par excellence. For women who served in the Association of Arab American University graduates, he, Nasir, was the go-to comfortable guy for help, advice, counsel, therapy, uh, lots of therapy, uh, working with a bunch of wonderful Arab men uh, in leadership positions. We needed, ther the women needed therapy. <laughs> he, con he conveyed an authentic, innate sense of gender equality. And it wasn't simply an equality spoken in words, but of work as well. He did more than his share of grub work. Among his other traits, Nasir always insisted on making sure individuals got credit for their work. In 1998, Nasir, Joyce, and I, and a whole bunch of other people, attended a workshop Nasir and I had put together. As you all know, Nasir was insistent uh, that the Palestine issue must be grounded in Arab unity and Arab nationalism. The workshop was with Arab intellectuals and activists from North America, Europe, and the Arab states, uh, including, of course, Palestine. The goal was to come up with ideas of how to reignite Arab support and engagement with Palestinian intellectuals and activists. During the meetings which Nasir chaired initially, a couple of the attendees were being a bit contrary. That's a very kind word. I'm, I'm trying to be kind today. Nasir was patient and he allowed everyone there say. He was an immensely patient man. The next day, he absolutely insisted I chair the session. This was his way of acknowledging to all present that I was an equal co-planner. I did not want to chair the session because Nasir was crucial to it. But Nasir insisted, so I chaired the session. During it, I could feel myself becoming ill. At the same time, the two rather argumentative guys, that's a very kind word, <laughs> were acting up, and I was generally less patient. I was always less patient than Nasir. And at that moment, I knew I was going to be physically sick. I quickly said to Nasir, you take over. And I went running out the room to the bathroom to evacuate my uh, intestines or something. Um, apparently, Nasir thought I was reacting to the insistent guys. <laughs> And he felt very upset, as only Nasir could be. He always got upset if he thought you were upset. And um, so that was typical of him. And Joyce and Jahan Hiddle came running after me and realized I was truly sick. To this day, I still wonder, I really do still wonder, if I got sick from a bug or if it was those guys who wished it on me. <laughs> Nasir also had a rather dry sense of humor. During his first presidency of the AAUG, he appointed a friend, a wonderful guy. Uh, I know him well, and he's fabulous. He, served, he appointed him to serve as treasurer. In the old AAUG, the board members did all the work. I mean, we didn't have professional help, and you can imagine, I can't even do my checkbook, and if I have to be treasurer, I. It's a disaster. But anyway, 
This guy was the treasurer, and he was to make sure that this part-time person that we had doing secretarial work <coughs> got paid and to withhold Social Security and taxes uh, from her paycheck. Now, the treasurer left uh, midstream for a job in the Gulf. And the seer asked me to take on that role. And I thought to myself, oh boy, he's really desperate. Um, so I did, and I only to discover that the previous treasurer did withhold Social Security and taxes, but rather than working from government tables, he simply took a guess at what amounts to withhold and never knew where to send them. <laughs> so they stayed in the treasury, but he did withhold money. When I told Nasir of the frustrating situation that needed to be corrected, he got that certain look in his eyes that only he could get, which exposed just how funny he thought it was. But at the same time, he was trying to convey a sense of guilt about his amusement because he knew I was peeved, and I was really peeved, and I'm not known for patience. The humor of the situation overtook him, and he said to me with a very sheepish grin on his face, and I quote, Elaine, but at least he figured out he had to withhold money. Yeah, I mean, even if alahadro, which means, for those of you who don't know Arabic, even if it was just out of his head. And I thought, well, all right. In any case, we, the elder members of the community, are grateful to Nasir. He really did assure a just future for Palestine, whether now or in the future, by mentoring a new generation of informed and principled activists from around the world who carry on his vision for one state with equality for all of its citizens. You know, Nasir had a favorite word that appeared in almost all of his writings in different contexts. That word was anchor. I would like to use it here to describe Nasir's relationship to his community of friends, colleagues, and activists. He was our anchor. We are grateful for his life, lived with dignity and honesty. Thank you, dear friend, and thank you, Joyce, for graciously sharing him with the community. Thank you very much. kind of uh, interesting to see so many of our old friends mixed with the younger generation, which uh, comes about mostly because I think they are friends of the Aruri kids and, and their children. And uh, it's uh, the mix of generations that's going to sustain the um, vision uh, that Nasir had uh, for his community. You know, I uh, am Mujid Kazemi and I've uh, known Nasir uh, for almost 40 some years. Um, I believe Nasir uh, belonged to a generation of giants that um, has uh, through dedication and through cleverness and super ability to influence the people around them, uh, elevated the plight of the Palestinians to a level uh, on the uh, world platform that uh, is higher than otherwise would have been the case. And that's a contribution that uh, all of us from Palestine would always remember. Uh, Nasir acquired his preeminence in three circles. Uh, we heard about the 
uh, academic life and his position in this university. Um, but he was also a super uh, analyst of the U.S. policy in the Middle East and so much in demand uh, for comments by media, uh, both in the U.S. and international media, that he was often representing uh, the uh, faults that uh, uh, the U.S. policy has uh, uh, undertaken over the years uh, towards that region. And his third um, preeminence was in his ability to support institutions and build them uh, that uh, can defend the rights of the ordinary people who's uh, not able always to stand up to uh, the mighty uh, in their own communities and uh, and uh, he, wa he, he built many such institutions both here and in the Arab world. Uh, you, you heard and you probably will hear more about these things. Let me say, um, I'd like to say something more from my personal experiences uh, about Nasir. Uh, we share a lot of memories. I personally came to know him uh, only two months after I landed in the U.S. back in September 67, when some of my friends uh, told me there is a national gathering in uh, um, at Northeastern University uh, for a new organization called the Association of Arab American University Graduates. So um, I went uh, in November of 69 and attended that convention and that's where I met him and I think that's where he was elected to become the next president of the AAUG. And that's where Boston was elected to be the site of the next uh, convention of the AAUG. Um, I admired his talents to speak up his mind and to organize a large group of people and uh, to concentrate on what's important and avoid what is really frivolous. Uh, frivolous. That, that is not often the case uh, in organizations where people want to take time and not produce results. But Nasir uh, kept his focus on what is important. Um, and, and most of all, um, I admired the fact that he had a beautiful wife who was uh, supportive of his activities and willing to store the files of the AUG that were accumulating very, very fast in her own basement. Um, now, I must have been influenced by all of that because uh, I found uh, that with time, you know, I ended up an academician. I live in Massachusetts. I even married a uh, girl from Springfield, but she's not willing to store all my files in her basement. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, we uh, shared with the Aruris a lot of nice moments. Uh, we had uh, uh, probably first met Nazik and I at their house when uh, they invited few people to get ready for the convention in Boston. And N Nazik was there as I was. And uh, of course, uh, we've, we've come to know uh, each other and things moved from there. Uh, we've, when, we've gone to the house many times where we uh, had barbecues and uh, made uh, good use of the vegetable garden and the uh, swimming pool in the backyard. And uh, as a matter of fact, Nasir was the one who taught my children all to fish. I know nothing about fishing. I used to go with them and we used to stand at a bridge and uh, to my surprise, you know, the fish under the bridge was willing to take uh, all the uh, baits that were uh, dangling. <laughs> so, uh, you know, whether Nasir was skillful or whether just the spot was good, I'm not quite, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, 
You know, Nasir, I, I went to uh, many uh, missions for the AAUG, uh, particularly to raise funds when there was a lot of activity and we needed those funds. And I really appreciated the fact that although Nasir had put many hours in the early years of the AAUG uh, in uh, strengthening the organization and raising funds for it, um, that he was willing to come later on uh, after having, in a way, done his duty and, and join uh, the delegation and give it credibility uh, with sources of funding, uh, whether it's here or in the Middle East. And uh, I do share one thing with Nasir that others don't. Uh, both he and I were elected twice to be the presidents of AUG. And I don't think any others were, uh, if my memory is right. Uh, so it was a full life. It was a full of commitment to the Palestine cause. It was full of commitment to human rights everywhere. And I don't think it's uh, by accident that he ended up on so many boards of uh, human rights organizations. It is really what he believed in, what he cared about. Uh, but he was also a man who enjoyed life and was not in it to build his image or his prominence. He enjoyed the simple things about life, being with friends, with family. And uh, he did commit a lot of time to that. So, um, like the Aruris, My family and I lost a dear friend. <laughs> and uh, we know that he left with a wealth of uh, products that will carry his uh, words uh, for many years to come about what is right and how to bring it about and what is wrong and what we should be speaking uh, about, um, I have every confidence that many of the people here will carry his message in the years to come. And uh, maybe if I uh, paraphrase Abraham Lincoln by saying, in the long term, right will make might. Thank you very much. Nineteen eighty-eight was a pivotal year for me. In that year, I got fully immersed in my job at the American Civil Liberties Union. I made my first trip to Palestine in the early years of the Intifada. And as a consequence of both my work with the ACLU and my fledgling familiarity with the West Bank and Gaza, I was fortunate enough to meet Nasir. In that year, I was asked to help organize a conference for social studies teachers at the Kennedy Library in Boston. My role was to locate a speaker who could put the Palestinian case forward while someone else would invite a pro-Israel speaker. I somehow found my way to Nasir, who shared the Kennedy Library stage with an Israeli law professor. To this day, I remember her cutting arrogance, her condescension, and downright rudeness. But was Nasir ruffled? Not a bit. While she fulminated against Palestinians for refusing to submit to the occupation, he embodied a calm dignity as he eviscerated her arguments. If you come to my house, he said, and use your weapons, to evict me and claim ownership, and then move in with your extended family, wouldn't you expect me to protest? And I remember he had the teachers very much on his side. From that beginning, Nasir and I went on to work together on two fronts. The ACLU greatly valued Nasir's commitment to civil liberties and civil rights, 
I remember a meeting at Nasir and Joyce's house where our executive director, John Roberts, and I tried to convince him to go beat the point person for our organization's new Southern Massachusetts chapter. Whether the issue was academic freedom, the excesses of the USA Patriot Act, or the targeting of Arab Americans and Muslims as a new, quote, enemy within, Nasir could always be counted on as a stalwart supporter. But it was the struggle for Palestinian rights that brought us most closely together. Late in 1988, I founded an organization called the Middle East Justice Network with the modest mission of changing US policy towards Israel and Palestine. And Nasir, as you know, uh, would go on to write fully and deeply about this subject. And he was, from the start, an indispensable mentor and collaborator who helped set the compass for our work, who wrote for our publication, Breaking the Siege, and spoke at our conferences. He was simply unstinting with his time and his advice. Nasir's input enabled us to be especially prescient in our analysis of the Oslo process and what its impact was likely to be. More than 20 years ago, he saw clearly that the so-called peace process would, as he wrote in Breaking the Siege, quote, operationalize the concept of greater Israel, making a Bantustan solution the only realistic option for the Palestinians in the occupied territories, end quote. Its aim, he wrote, was the consolidation of an apartheid system. That was back in 1994. The demise of the, demise of the Middle East Justice Network in 1995 did not spell the end of our partnership. You heard about his role as an institution builder, and we worked together throughout the late 90s um, on a lot of uh, institutional building work with the Boston Committee on the Middle East in the early years of Tari. And um, then he was one of the people who really helped us get off the ground some new organization at the time called the Boston Coalition for Palestinian Rights, which still exists today. And so we collaborated until really his illness. Um, it was just such a rich uh, way to get to know someone. Whether the issue was the annihilation of human rights in Palestine or elsewhere around the globe, or whether it was the undermining of human and civil rights here in the United States, Nasir was committed to making this a better world in which rights were not just words on a piece of paper. And I feel deeply privileged to have learned from and joined forces with a scholar activist of such exceptional dedication, ability, and grace. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Carroll. I was a uh, colleague of his in the political science department here for very, very, very many years. And um, it was the great privilege of my life, actually, to work with him. Uh, on our way in, uh, um, I saw Jean Doyle, who was also our colleagues with Nasir and I and several others, and said, well, what should I say about him, Jean? And she said, well, he was a great guy. And you know, I think that, uh, that really captures it about him. He was absolutely a terrific guy. In, in every imaginable way. Um, life in the department with him was very interesting, actually. Um, it has its hazards, and um, it had its um, ups and downs, uh, but um, always he greeted um, each obstacle with a sense of humor, and you know, he has quiet dignity that, um, that uh, spread to the rest of us as uh, as we worked with him and the more we worked with him. And, um, you know, political scientists and academicians generally tend to be a very rumpled group, and he was certainly the most elegantly dressed person in the department, maybe in the university, I don't know. And I often used to think it was Joyce's doing, but I've changed my mind on that recently. Who, who was it? 
It was him. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Um, he um, was actually the founder of the department uh, because you know he 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 actually worked at several universities. I don't know if you knew this. He worked at Southeastern Massachusetts Technological Institute, and he worked at Southeastern Massachusetts University, and then he worked at Mass Dartmouth. Well, of course they're all the same, uh, but. Um, at the point at which it, it became a full-fledged university, um, he was uh, the rock on which uh, the political science department was built. And uh, he, his was the guiding hand, and um, he brought in a tremendous diversity of people. Um, uh, he brought in the always very eccentric Shokat Ali, for those of you who might remember him. Um, Jean Doyle, um, uh, who was... Um, very active in the women's movement at the time, uh, which underlines the point that Elaine was making about his feminism. Um, he brought in, um, uh, he brought me in, for heaven's sakes. I can't imagine what he was thinking of, but he did anyway. Uh, he saved me from my exile in the Midwest, and I was very pleased to come back and, uh, and, and, and to work with him. Uh, the department has certain characteristics in those days, uh, and I hope it still does, actually. Um, one was that we always, without failing, treated every single student with dignity. I mean, that was one of the hallmarks of the regime under Nasir. And uh, you, you know, you would occasionally hear colleagues in the corridors talking about, you know, they, they can't write, they can't read, they can't do this, they can't do the other thing. Never a word of that would pass in our department, and each member of the student body it was viewed as a, as a really a gift to us. People that we could work with. Um, in his case, to befriend, I mean, I don't know if you noticed the number of former students who are here. That really speaks to a person who touched the students. Uh, it's absolutely remarkable, um, his relationships with, uh, with many of his students. Um, the way he, he brought them along, the, the way he, he took all the students very, very seriously for themselves. And they didn't have to be stellar scholars in order for him to do that, or for the rest of us either in, in those days. We, we followed his lead. Um, and the department also had a sense of, uh, shall we say, uh, them versus us, uh, which I think uh, most academicians will recognize, you know, them being, of course, the administrators. and. Um, and um, we got out of that an enormous amount of amusement, actually, to uh, tweak the administrators when we had the opportunity. And I won't tell you any of the details because many of them are not fitted for, suited for a, a group such as this. But uh, we, had, um, we had great fun with that. But it also meant that the department had a sense of cohesion and a sense of mission that it shared in common. Uh, cohesion amongst ourselves, but also in our relationships with our students uh, and with the rest of the rest of the institution. And he built a, a, a political science department that was committed uh, not just to the discipline but to the application of the discipline and its principles to the external life of the community. Uh, his, his own work, is, which is being discussed very much today, but also mentioned Jean, Jean Doyle who, who was at the cutting edge of the feminist movement in Rhode Island. Um, um, a couple of other faculty members who worked very hard in the city of Fall River to improve its governance. And there were others as well. So it was a, it was a committed uh, department uh, to its students and um, uh, to each other and uh, to, the, to the external, external commit community. And one of the things I think that um, he and I shared, and, and most of us shared actually in the department, was this view of the university as servicing a particular group in the region. And that is students who required the university uh, as a step, as an ability, as a place where they could learn the tools that would allow them to step out, to get good jobs, uh, to leave the region even. And often those students were, usually those students at the beginning certainly, were all, almost always the sons and daughters of immigrants, or immigrants themselves, as was three members of our department. So we had a special appreciation for that role, I think, uh, the role of the institution as, as, uh, as the uh, source for opportunity for um, local uh, children and, 
and uh, local parents and their, and their children. And we took that uh, very, very seriously. Um, Nasir was, uh, was very good as a, um, as a department chairperson. Um, he ruled, now that's not the right word, he, 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 um, he assisted all of us in governing uh, the department and making decisions. He was very collegial. He was very, very open to suggestion when he was department chair, which he was for, for, for a great deal of time. Um, he always looked to, to whether or not the decisions we made were good for students, whether they were good for the university, whether they were good for the department. Uh, and uh, he, he approached it all with a real, really with a sense of humor, with a sense of balance, and with underlying it a, a sense of justice. And, you know, the, I think the, the great triumph of Nasir's life I is, that, is that he's touched so many individuals and changed the way in which they think about life and think about themselves and, and move about the society. And uh, that's the great triumph of his life. The great tragedy is, of course, that, that he never got to see his wish fulfilled for, for his own people. And um, so that was a dark side of life in the department because we always knew that that was lurking in the background. I remember one day he came into work and he said, John, he said, uh, they came onto our land yesterday and they, they cut down all our trees. Those were what we called the Roman trees. A group of people, they, they turned out not to be settlers because I don't think they seized the land, uh, had come on and they simply cut down the uh, olive trees in the back of his land. And he was never sure, it seemed, um, when another incident of that sort would occur. And so there was always this darker lurking possibilities. And we all sensed it, we all knew it. And um, yet he went on with a great sense of humor, a great sense of, of vigor and, and, um, and, and his goals, both for the department, for students uh, and for Palestinians. He was a terrific friend. He really was. And um, he and Joyce were extremely welcoming. They would hold uh, soirees, shall we say, uh, down there in, um, in Dartmouth. And uh, we would come and chat and eat um, wonderful uh, food. Uh, although I must say I disappointed him once. He, he asked me, you know, what was the best cuisine? And I said, well, you know, um, I said French. Um, and then Indian, and then, and then Middle Eastern. He said, French? Do you really think French is better than Middle Eastern food? <laughs> he, was, he was quite shocked at that. I, I had uh, been a bit of a traitor. Um, but he, as I say, he was a real friend, and, um, and uh, very generous and giving of his time and energy and his, his goodwill. And, um, uh, but like Jamal, uh, I, I noticed certain flaws in his character. Um, he never did understand what all the, what all the, uh, the to-do was about the Red Sox. And I remember trying to explain to him the rules of American football, and he looked at me and he said, really? <laughs> and um, also on, on his playlist, I don't think Little Richard and Fats Domino and uh, the Big Bopper ever appeared. But beyond that, we would, would have to say that he was an absolutely, absolutely remarkable person. And, he, and he, I think his relationship with his family, too, was something that, uh, that, that we all felt uh, that he led the way on that, too. The, the wonderful relationship that he had with, his, uh, with Joyce, of course, and wonderful Joyce, and with his children, and with his grandchildren, but also with his son-in-law, Paul, and with his daughters-in-law. Danielle and Linda and Mona. And um, I think uh, I will always uh, treasure his memory and think of him often. Good afternoon, my name is Abdeen Jabbar. I <coughs> have come from New York City uh, to be here with you and to celebrate 
the life of Nasir Aruri, uh, a very dear friend. Um, uh, we were told that May the 15th is the end of the calendar year for this uh, school, but it also marks another day, and that day is the day that Palestine ceased to exist and a, uh, Israel was created and over a million Palestinians were driven out of 456 villages in Palestine. I say that, that this happened 67 years ago, this coming May, because in June, 48 years ago, Nasir was a university professor, and the Six-Day War occurred. The rest of Palestine was occupied, portions of Egypt and Syria, and Arabs everywhere were in a state of incredible shock. The creation of Israel and the destruction of Palestine is known on every Arab's tongue as a Nakba, a disaster. The occupation in June of 1967 is known as a Naksa, a setback. At the time of that Naksa, that setback, Nasir Aruri was a young professor who was finding his way and he asked an eminent anti-Zionist rabbi to come and speak on campus, whose name was Elmer Berger. At that time, the head of the ADL office in Boston come to here to speak to the then president of the university, Joseph Driscoll, to complain why they would allow this rabbi to come to speak. It was anti-Semitic. And Joseph Driscoll turned him away and said, he has a right to come and speak, and Dr. Aruri has a right to invite him. So I want to take this moment to thank this university for the support that they have given to Dr. Aruri over all of these years, and for their standing up for the principles of academic freedom. You've heard now about the creation of this organization, the Association of Arab American University Graduates. I was there at the founding of it, at a meeting of the Orientalist Society at the University of Michigan in 1967. And it was after that that I first met Nasir. I, I don't recall exactly how long after that. He was not at that meeting. But I bonded with him immediately. He was a man of incredible gentleness. He was the essence of gentleness. And he was, uh, there was absolutely no ego involvement in what he was doing. He just was a, just a, a person that you could not help but love. Well, we created this organization, this AAUG, and we were the Native Americans that had formed this wagon circle in what was a very hostile environment, and that is what the United States was in June of 1967. The media, the television, the radio, the newspapers trumpeted the Israeli victory over the dirty Arabs and the Palestinians. This they saw as their victory. And we are living the results of that to this day, to this day. So we said, we will go out there and try to reach the American people, not the congressman, not the Israeli-occupied Congress. 
we said we will try to reach the American people, although we weren't sure that this would make a difference. But we did. We had seminars and teach-ins and lectures, and we went from door to door, knocking on the doors, and for one simple purpose, one simple purpose is what Nasir was all about, and that was raising consciousness about Palestinian trauma. Because nobody's trauma trumps anybody else's trauma. Everybody's trauma is a valid issue and must be discussed and recognized. But that is what all of these books of Nasir's is about, recognizing Palestinian trauma. And until, and that now, by the way, is happening today in this country. It has taken a long time. It has taken all these years. This week uh, was a recognition, the Pope came out with a recognition and a statement about the Armenian genocide a hundred years ago. The Armenians have been asking for recognition about the trauma and the genocide that occurred to the, uh, the Armenians. And the Palestinians have been asking and pleading for support for their, uh, the trauma that they suffered. And that is what Nasir was about. I just want to uh, just leave you with a couple of small anecdotes about my life with Nasir over the years. I was the fourth president of this AAUG, and Nasir is the one who nominated me. And uh, we had a convention that year in, in uh, <coughs> um, San Diego, and at the Claremont Hotel, and our keynote speaker was Andreas Papandreou, who was an economist and former uh, uh, head of the Greek government. And it was the occasion that we would have a membership meeting of the AUG members at these conventions, and the president would give a presidential address. And these meetings were very boring generally and, and not very well attended. And I had to give an address. And so I gave an address, and I don't, I don't even remember what I said. But Nasir came up to me afterwards, and he spoke to me not in English, but in Arabic. And he said, Khitab Mufkif, which means that was a very educated speech. And I can't tell you how good that made me feel, to have him come up and speak to me in Arabic and tell me that I gave an educated speech. There were a couple of other things that happened during the years with AAUG that I just want to leave you with. One of them was um, a resolutions committee I was on with Nasir uh, at a convention it was held here in Massachusetts in 1980 after Iraq had invaded Iran. And we, in our resolutions committee, decided we wanted to go on record condemning the Iraqi invasion of Iran. Well, that was very uh, controversial, to say the least. Some Iraqi Baathists had come prepared and had brought their legions to the convention. Thank God we got their uh, subscription money before they <laughs> found out what we were going to do. <laughs> they uh, they uh, didn't like it at all, and in fact, when we came out of the meeting room where it was the resolution and put it to the floor and started to debate it, it got very, very heated, and it ended up with them rising en masse and walking out of the room. To me, that was Nas sheer Nasir Aruri, principled and understood that these situations of war are not going to solve the problems, are not going to solve the problems in the Middle East. And he dedicated his whole life, his whole life, I mean driven, driven as so many of us were by the idea about helping to bring this trauma that this small people, 
this very small people the Palestinians had experienced to the light of America. Another thing that happened that is somewhat humorous that I was reminded about last night talking with Joyce. In 1982, I don't know whether any of you recall, the Israelis invaded Lebanon and they bombed and they uh, uh, torpedoed and they did everything they could and ultimately it, it led to over 17,000 civilian deaths in Lebanon. Now can you imagine that? 17,000 civilian deaths? And so Nasir called me up. I was a practicing lawyer in Detroit at the time and he said, Abdeen, we've got to do something drastic. I said, well, what do you want to do, Nasir? He said, you've got to come tomorrow to Washington and we're going to go in and we're going to sit in, not the Israeli embassy, the Saudi embassy. Because we said the Saudis are an ally of the United States and the United States can call off this mad dog Israel. So what did I do? I got a flight and I went to Washington. And we went in, we made an appointment with the ambassador who, uh, and we went in and it was all nice and he ordered tea for us. And we sat there and Joyce was with us actually. Ordered tea, we exchanged some pleasantries. And then it was time for the embassy to close and we wouldn't leave. So she said, well, we're closing. We said, we're not leaving. We want, we want Saudi Arabia to do something to stop the killing in Lebanon. So he left and we stayed. And Joyce reminded me, or told me, I, I wasn't aware of this, she said, you snored that night. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I told her, well, I still do, Joyce, and that's one thing that hasn't changed in all the things that have changed. Well, those, those are just two of the small things that I recall, but there's one thing that I want to say in closing. Many, I, I was born in Michigan, raised in Michigan, my parents came to the United States from Lebanon in 1910. Uh, but many of the emigre Arabs uh, had, uh, who were brought up in the age of Arab nationalism, of uh, uh, this whole Palestinian issue weighing down on everyone, with a, a difficulty in coming to say, Arab American. They, 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 it was just difficult. And Nasir had a lot of difficulty with that. And if you want to really find out about it, you can read his little memoir in this special issue of the Arab Studies Quarterly. It's a beautiful piece that he wrote, and it appeared in 2002, and it contains the, his thinking about this, about how he thought of himself as an Arab, but, but had trouble getting out that word American after it. But he did. He ultimately did. And he said what did it for him was the 1967 war because it made him realize that he are, is here in this country, this country that is supporting these actions by Israel with American tax dollars, and that he's got to do something about it not because he's an Arab, but because he's here and he's got to reach out to each and every American and tell them the truth. So, and that has, that, we've talked about legacy tonight, or this afternoon. I, you know, in the, over the past week I've been calling around and talking to some people and young Arab Americans, and I think you cannot believe how different today is than it was in 1967. There's Arab American literary journals. There are Arab American studies in universities. There are uh, Arab American internship programs. It's, it's, a, it's a changed world out there. And it's a changed world on the Palestine question. And the reason is because of the steadfastness 
and the doggedness and the burning in the stomach of people like Nasir. Thank you. For over 30 years, Nasir and I were close colleagues and dear intimate friends. A friendship that only deepened after he and Joyce moved, bought a condo about 15 years ago, just a few miles from our home. We spent many wonderful hours together having a great deal of fun, but there was never a time when we didn't talk about politics. I especially admired Nasir as a public intellectual and a tireless activist on behalf of his own people. He was also the most principled, ethical human being I've ever known. He was completely consistent in his outstanding scholarship and his political assessments. I cherished his friendship more than I can say. Many of you are probably familiar with his seminal book published in 2003, Dishonest Broker, in which he carefully dissected in a thorough and unwavering manner his contention that the U.S.-Israeli relationship was based on Israel being considered a strategic asset to American national interests. Nasir methodically scrutinized this relationship and America's false claim of being an honest broker in a peace process, a process in which he argued was never designed to bring about real peace, but rather provided Israel with the necessary cover to expropriate more Palestinian land and deny Palestinians their basic rights. Nasir also took his own leadership to task for complicity in this process. He was one of the first Palestinian, prominent Palestinians to speak out against the Oslo Agreement, which he correctly uh, described as, as a surrendering of all fundamental Palestinian <coughs> rights under international law. The exchange for it was an open-ended and loosely defined framework that would inevitably uh, favor the stronger side, Israel, and impose its will on the weaker side, the Palestinians. He criticized the Palestinian leadership for un its unpreparedness, lack of any concrete strategy, and in effect becoming Israel's uh, subcontractor in managing the occupation. Unfortunately, the Seer's concerns were validated validated as the years of fruitless negotiation followed, following Oslo, Israeli leaders now openly admit there will never be a Palestinian state, the settler population has tripled, and the PA is on the verge of collapse. Nasir was diligently working on an update of that book, as well as on his memoir, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2006 which affected every aspect of his health. In truth, my physician husband, Marty, uh, observed signs of the illness several years earlier. Nevertheless, Nasir continued to struggle with the uh, update and the memoir for 10 years until his massive stroke in August 2014. I know it was the greatest desire of his life to finish that examination of U.S. policy through the Obama years. But sadly for him, and even more sadly for us, he wasn't able to do so. Today we memorialize and celebrate the, the life of this extraordinary man. So much has already been said, it's quite wonderful. Nasir was my, my mentor as well as my colleague. I remember once very early in our acquaintanceship I was asked to, to give a talk at a conference. I don't remember where or under whose auspices, but I was to talk about the meaning of the initiation of uh, U.S. talks with the PLO in 1988. I found myself a rather green assistant, associate, assistant, sorry, professor on a panel with three very prominent Palestinian scholars. 
I gave my analysis, essentially saying that the talks did not represent any change in US policy. I spoke first, but all three following speakers strongly condemned my analysis and even engaged in some ad hominem attacks. I left the conference in tears and later phoned Nasir, who comforted me and told me that I was correct and just to stay the course. I can't tell you how much his support meant to me. I will add that later I became friends with two of those men and one of them even apologized for the way they treated me that day. A few personal anecdotes that I would like to share in the following minutes. I've never known a couple as devoted to each other as Joyce and Nasir. They were both lovers and the best of friends who shared everything in life from politics to cooking. And Nasir adored Joyce, offered expressing his admiration for her many accomplishments. For example, her business acumen, her creative interior design, which made their home so warm and lovely. Her gracious Middle Eastern hospitality that was extended to everyone who came to visit. And especially her ability to repair anything, everything, a much needed uh, asset in the Aurori home. They were both utterly devoted. I will say that Joyce occasionally, sort of, complained about the extent of Nasir's affection for her, but I know she treasured it, and I always wished I had the same complaint. <laughs> <laughs> they were both utterly devoted parents who together raised their four children with superb values and ethics. I can think no other of no other family in which at least one child was not, as they say, a problem. Well, Ferris, Jay, Jamal, and Karen never gave their parents trouble of any sort. And as adults, they have remained intensely close to each other and to their parents, which is a very, cl very clear testament to how Nasir and Joyce raised them. Nasir was extremely proud of all of them. Each excelled in their professional lives and raised their 13 grandchildren with the same values Nasir and Joyce imparted to them. I know that Joyce could not have gotten through Nasir's illness without the constant support of their children at her side. Nasir's grandchildren were the great joy of his life. He cherished each and every one of them. I have a wonderful picture of Nasir gliding down a slide into their pool, holding about three small grandchildren in his arms. I know he delighted in them immensely, and they brought him much happiness. We had many dinners at Joyce and Nasir's, and knowing that we loved Middle Eastern food, Nasir always made falafel while Joyce provided the side dishes and the salad. But falafel was Nasir's bailiwick, and as Marie pointed out, many other things as well. And he was always so pleased that we appreciated his cooking. Actually, Nasir and Marty had their own special relationship. They often went out on the Sears boat to fish and cruise the intercoastal, sometimes venturing into the open. Joyce, who has a smell superior to that of a hound dog, was adamantly opposed to smoking. Once she caught Marty having a puff in her bathroom and gave him a real dressing down. <laughs> and Sears was not a smoker, but on those occasions on the boat, he always asked Marty for a cigarette. I imagine Joyce would have been appalled had she known. And they both loved gin and tonics, which were permanently the first order of business whenever we got together. Meanwhile, Joyce and I had a pale glass of wine or water. Whenever Jamal visited, paid a visit to Florida, and Nasir would always ask Marty to go with him on a nighttime gambling cruise, where seven miles off the Palm Beach shoreline, Marty and Jamal intensely played blackjack. Nasir, meanwhile, split his time between playing the nickel slots and coming over to the, table, to the blackjack table to express dismay and disbelief that Jamal and Marty would be playing at a minimum $25 a hand table. When the stakes were raised, so was Nasir's heart rate. <laughs> but when either Marty or Jamal won a big hand, Nasir would be more, than a stat more ecstatic than the players themselves. Nasir was not a gambler, at least not overtly, 
but he did play the stock market in a way that my conservative husband, Marty, would have never dreamed of. Nasir and the late Palestinian sociology professor Samir Forsoon were soulmates at the deepest, deepest level. And at some point, Nasir convinced Nasir to purchase a condo in Boca. The, the six of us spent many wonderful times together. The last time was a dinner at our house, and Samia died suddenly several weeks later. I don't need, think Nasir ever recovered from that death, from that loss. He grieved openly to me for years, and I think that he would have wanted Samia to be mentioned in this memorial. Nasir was a Muslim, not a very uh, observant one to be sure, though his Palestinian Arab cultural heritage was deeply ingrained in his character, and he remained true to it in every sense. He was indeed the quintessential Arab man, yet he was the most gentle man, the least authoritarian man I've ever known. Meanwhile, he married Joyce, a, a Maronite Christian from Lebanon at a time when such things were utterly, utterly haram. What wonderful testaments to the true humanity of the man who was. Finally, despite being an internationally recognized scholar and intellectual, Nasir was utterly without heirs. He had no sense of self-importance, <coughs> conceit, or arrogance. I recall once sitting with him in a group of men where one man spouted off the most ridiculous ideas about the Middle East, and Nasir just listened quietly, never interrupting or challenging the man's comments. I, on the other hand, was livid, but bit my tongue as I was the only woman in the room. Superb scholar, committed public intellectual, dedicated human rights activist, loving husband, devoted father, adoring grandfather, and dear, dear friend. Nasir was and is treasured. He's deeply missed by both Marty and I, and I'm sure the void in our lives will never be filled. of our pride and joy. I'd like to thank Chancellor Gro Grossman and her staff, John Huey, Robin Brow, for their work. It was tireless and it was compassionate and we really appreciate it as a family. I also want to thank Maria, our dearest friend, and the rest of our dear friends, Elaine, Cheryl, Nancy, Hanny, Abdeen, Mujid, and John, and all of you who've traveled so far, because I know people came from California, from Florida, from Tennessee, from everywhere to be with us today. This family really, really appreciates it. I can't tell you. And Nasir would never, never have expected anything like this. He never would have. More than half a century ago, I went to a dance sponsored by my church and met the person who would change, fulfill, and magnify my life. Nasir always said it was love at first sight, and I want to add that it was love at last sight. Nasir and I shared exactly 54 years of marriage. Nasir was very efficient. I kissed him goodbye on February 12th, 2015, the 54th anniversary of our wedding. Our marriage was one of unconditional love, mutual respect, and unwavering support, though our backgrounds and personalities should have made us completely incompatible. Our life was rich in contradictions. Nasir was quiet and intellectual. I'm noisy. 
extroverted and business mind. Nasir had no knowledge of sports. Actually, the children, the grandchildren said to him the other day before he got sick, um, Cito, do you know who uh, Tom Brady is? And Nasir, trying to act like he really knew what was going on, said, yes, he plays for the Red Sox. <laughs> He had no knowledge of interest in sports, and I'm an avid fan. He used to say, you know, Joyce, all over America, women are saying to their husbands, come sit with me and leave the football game. I'm the only man asking his wife to come and sit with me and leave the football game. Nasir also had no plumbing or carpentry skills. One day I asked him to tighten the screws on our toilet. What a mistake. He tried to tighten them with a wedge and a hammer. <laughs> Needless to say, you never take a hammer to a ceramic toilet. So that, of course, was the end of the toilet. After that, if I needed help, I did the work myself or became very skilled at calling in the professionals to do the repairs after Nasir went to school. <laughs> Even more significant, our contrasting personalities, our tr religious traditions were different. But Nasir's qualities, as all who knew him well will attest, transcended differences. He was the living example of a gentle man. Members of my extended family once spoke of the way he uplifted and inspired them. My late brother Peter once said to me that Nasir was the best thing that ever happened to our family. Sweet-tempered, modest and kind, he was a person of fierce principles, but no viciousness. He possessed a nobility of spirit and of purpose and a devotion to the cause of human rights that could neither be bought nor diverted. On June 4th, 1967, Nasir was awarded his PhD at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. His father had traveled to the United States for the first time to see his son secure his diploma. It was a proud culmination of hopes, hard work, and sacrifices made all the more precious by Nasir's father, by his presence. Our joy spilled over. We had much to celebrate. Our newest son was two months old, and our daughter took her first steps at the graduation party my mother and father had proudly prepared for him. But our happiness turned inside out the next morning when our five-year-old son, Faris, put, put on the television and said, Mommy, Mommy, there's a war in Palestine. With that sentence, our lives changed forever. The Six-Day War shook Nasir to the core. From that point, he dedicated himself to his people. He wrote, he organized, he spoke with all the passion of his great heart and the power of his superb intelligence to illuminate the Arab world to the West and to plead for justice for the Palestinians. Because of his art and activism, he became an internationally recognized advisor on geopolitical affairs. I have to tell you that for 33 years, he taught at this university, two of them as chancellor professor. This university, both administration and his department, supported his freedom to express his unconventional political views. He brought a large and diverse number of nationally and internationally known figures to speak at university forums. Though he grappled almost daily with issues of international significance, he remained always an involved and loving fa father to our four children, Faris Nasir, Karen Lila, Jamal Thomas, and Jay Hudson, and later an attentive grandfather to our 13 grandchildren. The man who helped them understand the Palestinian perspective when, he had, when they had to do social study projects for, for school was the same man whose eloquent voice drew the world's attention to the cause of human rights. He was a superlative role model for them and a devoted, tender husband to me. And I want to tell you that each of these children standing here, whenever they had a social studies project, it was always something about the Middle East, always something about Palestine. One of, our children, one of our grandchildren, Maddie, was asked by her teacher the other day, isn't that a big subject for you? 
and Maddie was able then to tell her teacher about her grandfather. And they very often uh, have teachers who knew Nasir, who were their student. Uh, our granddaughter Lila wrote a report about her grandfather one day. And the teacher said, oh, Lila, she said, you have to come and see Mrs. Robb because Mrs. Robb went to that university. And she said, let's go over and talk to Mrs. Robb. And they went to Mrs. Robb and Mrs. Robb said, yes, Lila, I was your grandfather's uh, student. I can't believe that you're his grandchild. He was the most wonderful professor. This is Lila's experience. And each of them had had an experience like that. Every family has its favorite stories, and Nasir figures prominently in some of ours. I'd like to tell you one that has been affectionately repeated through the years because it shows a comical and endearing side of him. Back in the days, we owned a boat, and often we went out on it. Nasir was very adept at navigating the boat until we approached the pier. Then he would throw up his hands and say, Fettus, park the car, park the boat. There was no use correcting him. He never appreciated that the word park was used for a boat and that what you did to, to uh, that you, I'm sorry, that the word park was used for a car and that you used dock to, to park a boat. To this day, friends of our oldest son delight in saying to him, Fettus, park the boat. <laughs> My husband, the humble humanist, the incorruptible, out, the in, incorruptible, sorry, I need some water, activist, the cherished man of both my dreams and my reality has gone from us. He's left us with a priceless legacy. Thanks, thanks Maria. That we will always try to honor and a great void that we will never fill. Thank you, Nasir, for the gift of yourself and for the light of your love and goodness that will continue to shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in the dark corners of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce, for that wonderful um, sharing of your life with Nasir, and uh, we really appreciated it. It was oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, we're going to have the, our short video slideshow, and then after that, um, love to have everyone join us for refreshments and uh, some wonderful food, including some Arabic food. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>